name is Cody Leekian. I am a student at Manhattan Christian College. I am going into my third year of study. I have declared my major to be theological research with an emphasis in New Testament studies. Um, I am getting married here in two weeks to Miss Lily. And, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and I'm here to bring your message. Would you guys bow your heads and pray? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us for those who have trespassed against us. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I was in the mountains of Colorado with my family as we were driving about, going to pick up our new puppy, the new addition to our family. And as we were there, it was the middle of winter, so the roads were a tad bit icy. And I remember sitting from the third row, looking out the front windshield as my dad is driving, as all five of us are sitting there. And I'm looking out that front windshield, and the next thing I know, and as I, it's almost as if I can blink, the horizon disappears, and the road is no longer ahead of us, but I'm overlooking a cliff. And as things start to slow down in my mind, and as slow motion begins to take place, I... I'm looking up the front windshield over this ridge, and all of a sudden I can't see anymore. And as I blink a couple times and start to bring what's into now coming in front of me into focus, it's now the little puppy is now bounding and spinning in front of me. And as the car spins out of control, Dad, being the skilled driver that he is, begins to start to pump the brakes and to turn into it. And as Dad tries to correct the vehicle and bring it around, he slightly nicks the corner of the car on the snowbank. And Thankfully, there was no oncoming traffic, and so the only damage that we had suffered was a slightly bent headlight bracket. We got back on the right side of the road, and as the rest of the trip progressed more cautiously from there. Sometimes in life, we feel like the passenger like I was, as you're sitting there idly by, you're looking out the front windshield, and all of a sudden, you enter into this spinning flurry, and there's nothing you can do but sit and watch, and you know exactly what's happening, but as you just watch, there's nothing more that you can do. Other times in life, we feel like we're the driver, and no matter how hard we try, and no matter how much we follow the protocol, we turn into the slide, we pump the brakes, we do everything that you're supposed to do. You just can't get that vehicle around that turn in time, and you end up hitting the snowbank. But then other times, we feel like the puppy. This poor little dog is just sitting there, prancing around, walking around, no seatbelt, no restraining harness, and then all of a sudden he's lifted off all fours and is just spinning around like super dog as this dog just is floating in the midair in the car. You see, in life, there are trials that we have. Some of these trials are small trials, and some of them are large, like the loss of a loved one, the loss of a job. But regardless of these trials, today I'm gonna, I want to walk you through how God can, can use these trials in your lives for good. Today we're going to be looking at King Nebuchadnezzar and the trials that he goes to and how God uses those for good. We're going to be reading out of the book of Daniel today. A little backstory so we're all caught up to speed on where we're at here. We remember the story of Daniel from when we were younger, right? The story of Daniel being thrown into the lion's den as he stands up for God and what God is doing. Catch you guys up to speed. Daniel is this guy who was removed from Jerusalem and brought to Babylon to serve the king. And once he was brought there, Daniel remained faithful to the Lord, no matter what trials were put in front of him. And as he goes about doing these things, the Lord blesses everything he touches. Essentially, everything Daniel touches turns to gold. And so as Daniel is succeeding, these other people are not succeeding as well as Daniel, so they become jealous of him. Their jealousy leads to this malice desire to have Daniel killed him. What they do next is, they come up with this plan to trick the king, Nebuchadnezzar, into throwing Daniel into the lion's den to be killed. Because they can't kill Daniel. I mean, that would be murder, right? And they can't just hire somebody to kill him because the king's going to find out. I mean, it's obvious. It's a, small, it's a small community. They all talk. They all know about that. And so they get Daniel thrown into the lion's den. The next morning when the king rolls away the stone to their own basement, they look and see Daniel standing there completely fine because he had not been touched. And then, as the story goes on, the people who were jealous of Daniel are thrown into the lion's den and their fate is sealed. But today, I tell you the story just so we can get all on the same page about the book that we're reading out of. But today's story is going to focus on King Nebuchadnezzar. 
The guy with the name whose name is so long that most of us in here would probably not even want to try spelling it. I know I wouldn't want to try spelling it because it would probably take me two or three attempts before I could fully spell it. But a little bit of backstory about King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the greatest ruler of the Neo-Babylonian period. He was one of the most competent monarchs in the ancient times. Nebuchadnezzar brought Babylon to the peak of its economic influence and political power. His, with his death in 562 BC, the glory of Babylon immediately began to fade. And within 26 short years, the entire city of Babylon ceased to exist. Now, a city that was once the largest and greatest city in all times, in all of the history, ceased to exist in 26 short years after the death of this king. If that doesn't say something about how great and how good this king is, then I don't know what does. You see, Nebuchadnezzar played a large part in biblical history. And in my opinion, he's arguably one of the most written about leaders in the Old Testament. Our story today is going to pick up right after the servant Daniel interprets his second dream. Daniel takes this dream that King Nebuchadnezzar has, and what he does is he says, King, there's this tree in your dream, and it's going to be cut down, bound by a steel band, and it's going to fall over, and it's going to sit in the dew in the wilderness, and it's going to become wet. And he says, King, this is just a giant metaphor for what's going to happen to you if you don't fix your ways. God's going to give you a period of time to humble yourself and to give your life to him. And if you don't, you're going to end up like this tree. Spoiler alert, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't listen to this, because why would he? He's the greatest king. I mean, he's just like, chip off his old block. He's like, look at me, I'm so great. And so this is where our story picks up in Daniel chapter 4. Just a heads up, I'm going to be reading out of the English Standard Version. It's a different translation, and there are many of them. Uh, some translations, like the New American Standard Bible are going to get you a more conservative and a more word-for-word -word translation from the original languages. Whereas a translation like the NIV is going to get you a more liberal translation, and it's going to be easier to read, and it's going to flow more as if you and I are talking, and as if a book we pick up and read in modern day. But I've chosen the English Standard Version to read out of today. And so if you'll turn with me to Daniel chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 29. At the end of the twelve months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he being Nebuchadnezzar. And the king answered and said, Is it not this great Babylon which I have built with my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? While those words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O oh, king Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men. And your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you, until you know the most high rules, and the kingdom of men gives to it whom he will. Immediately those words were fulfilled, and against King Nebuchadnezzar, he was driven from among men, and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, and his hair grew as long as eagles' feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. Where we're at in the story is King Nebuchadnezzar. He stands up on this roof overlooking his entire city, and from there, he says, look at what I've done. I've built this city up. I did this. And then as soon as he says that I'm the one that did this, look at me, oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, oh, look at what I've built. God says, I gave you one year. I gave you the dream, I gave you the interpretation, and I gave you one year. And you're up here standing, looking over this magnificent city with its thick walls, as many as there were, and with this great grand garden built on this man-made hill. And you look at it and you say that it's yours? Is it not I, the God of heaven and the universe, who gives you everything that you've had? How dare you say that? And so God takes him and removes his sanity. I imagine it almost as this is click in his brain. So King Nebuchadnezzar is going in his life and he's like, look at what I've got. And it's almost as if his brain just fractures. And then he's kept and he runs off into the wilderness. I don't know why, but I picture him kind of foaming at the mouth like a dog with rabies as he just runs off on all fours, just running into the wilderness because he has lost complete touch with reality. 
The Bible says he remained there until his hair was as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like those of bird's claws. Sometimes in life, we feel like these trials that we're going through are never going to end. We've been unemployed for God only knows how long. We've been sick for an incredibly long period of time. It just doesn't seem like things are getting better. But you know what? There's hope, and I know there's hope, because when we continue on reading in the story, we see that same hope. We pick back up with verse 34, and it says, At the end of these days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I bless the Most High, and I praise and honor Him who lives forever. For it is His domain is an everlasting domain, and it is His kingdom that endures from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing. And he does according to his will and among the most of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can say to his hand or say to him, What have you done? You see, Nebuchadnezzar was cast into the wilderness. His trial was losing his kingdom and losing his sanity. And he was thrown out into the wilderness. And in life we go through these trials. We might be in that wilderness right now. We might be in this trial that we just feel like it's never going to end. See, that, that nearly fatal car wreck that my family was in, it was quite the humbling experience as we were just driving around, driving home from picking up this new puppy. How could spirits not be any higher? We were feeling on top of the world. We just got this new member to our family, and we're driving. It's the middle of winter. We have four-wheel drive. We have a driver who's been driving for 20-plus years. How could it go wrong? It's at that moment, that radio blaring, everyone's just minding their own business, that we hit the black ice and we start spinning. And after we had regained control and we made sure everyone was okay, we'd realize something. Just because we have four-wheel drive doesn't mean that we can continue on this road at the speeds that are posted for summertime. The pass had just been closed the day before. And we had gone on it because it said it had been open. But freshly plowed roads, not enough time for the salt to melt the ice, just bleeds and breeds black ice, breeds these slippery conditions. And see, that's just exactly what God needed. He needed a time to humble us just to allow him to see that, that he was in control. And I don't know what you're going through in your lives. And I don't know what trials that you have. But I know that these trials are not for nothing. And that God is using them for some reason. And whatever that reason may be, he's using it for his good. Now walk with me on this analogy. There's a blacksmith. And a blacksmith's job is to take metal and it is to put it into this cast iron cauldron. And he's to take this cauldron, and he's to take this flame. And it's not just any fire. He can't just put two pieces of wood and light it, because that would be uncontrolled, and it would be hard to deal with and hard to work with. But this blacksmith takes this controlled fire. It's at a certain temperature, and it's at a certain width and height and everything, so that that blacksmith can melt down the, the metal ore and melt down the broken pieces of metal so that he can take that and then work with it and just to separate the pure from the impure, the pure metal ore from the dirt of the ground, the pure metal from the plastics that have gotten into it. And this blacksmith's job is to control the fire. And I like to think of God as the blacksmith and our lives as the metal ore and the trials that we're going through as the flames. This isn't just some fire, forest fire that started. This is God carefully crafting these flames to take these impurities in our lives and these, these things that we are separating us, these sins in our life that separate us from God. And he's taking this fire and he's using it to carefully melt off and to separate us from those impurities so that we can be closer to him and that we can worship him freely. And I know this is true because that our God is a redeemer. Because we see that in verse 36 of this chapter. And it reads, at the same time my reason returned to me, and the glory of my kingdom and majesty and splendor returned to me. 
My counselors and my Lord sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and, I, and still more greatness was added to me. You see, what happens here is that Nebuchadnezzar is restored back to power. Nebuchadnezzar comes back from the wilderness, and his advisors see him. And they don't say, well, good to have you back. You're an embarrassment to us. We can't have you here anymore. You ran off insane and you left us abandoned. We don't want you here. But instead, his advisors see him and they say, you've returned to us. And they welcome him back with open arms and they bring him back into his kingdom. And once he's established there, God says, now that you've learned that this is not your kingdom, but it's mine that I've given you control of. Now that you've learned that, Let's make it grow. And from there, Babylon continued to grow into this ginormous nation with many walls. And what a great military and a great economic leader because King Nebuchadnezzar let God in control. Had Nebuchadnezzar never learned that, that city could have been stagnant. That city could have failed sooner than it did. But Nebuchadnezzar gave the control over to God. And through these trials in his life, he said, wow, I've seen the error of my ways. I need to let God control this aspect of my life. And look at what God did. God made Babylon this great nation. What trials in our lives can we give over to God and say, God, you need to control this because this is not something that I can handle. What trials do we need to let go and that God can use and God can let us prosper so that we can become the best servants for Him. That we can become closer to Him. pick this up again with verse 37. And I think verse 37 is the turning point for this entire story. Verse 37 is where this is at. And this is where we can see everything come to fruition. It says, Now that I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol the honor of, king, of the King of Heaven, for all His works are right, and all His ways are just. And those who walk in pride, He is able to humble. Nebuchadnezzar sees it. He says, I walked in pride, and God humbled me. And this verse 37, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol the honor of the King of Heaven. That's what we've been waiting for. This prideful and arrogant man, he says, oh, well, everything that I can do. At the end of it, he says, no, look at everything God can do. Because God is the one in our lives who does everything. God is in control. God is the one who has given us everything that we have in our lives. And i got to give that praise back to him. Today we looked at this trial that Nebuchadnezzar went through. This wilderness experience that he was in. He left this kingdom, this palace, with this food on his table every single day. And he entered this wilderness where he lived like the animals. Where he ate the grass and the twigs and the berries. Where he walked on all fours as he was struggling to find touch with reality. And we watched as Nebuchadnezzar realized that this situation he was in is God working through him and trying to show him the error of his ways. And that is what brought Nebuchadnezzar to now praising and extolling our God, our Father in heaven, and this kingdom that now is now restored to him. And Babylon continued to grow. I challenge you as you go about your week, as we go about our week, to figure out what ways and what areas of our life do we need to give over to God for control? What areas are we trying to control? I'd like to invite Roger up to pray us out as we go about into our everyday week. And I thank you for letting, for letting me speak to you guys today.